Story 30 of Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1905 to 1906. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Remington. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1905 to 1906. By Lucy Maud Montgomery. Story 30. Their girl Josie. When Paul Morgan, a rising young lawyer with justifiable political aspirations, married Eleanor Ashton, leading woman at the Green Square Theater, his old schoolmates and neighbors in Spring Valley held up their hands in horror, and his father and mother up in the weather gray Morgan homestead were crushed in the depths of humiliation. They had been too proud of Paul, their only son, and such a clever fellow, and this was their punishment. He had married an actress. To Cyrus and Deborah Morgan, brought up and nourished all their lives on the strictest and straightest of old-fashioned beliefs, both as regards this world and that which is to come, this was a tragedy. They could not be brought to see it in any other light. As their neighbors said, Cy Morgan never hilt up his head again after Paul married that play-acting woman, but perhaps it was less his humiliation than his sorrow which bowed down his erect form and sprinkled gray in his thick black hair that fifty years had hitherto spared. For Paul, forgetting the sacrifices his mother and father had made for him, had bitterly resented the letter of protest his father had written concerning his marriage. He wrote one angry, unfilial letter back, and then came silence. Between grief and shame, Cyrus and Deborah Morgan grew old rapidly in the year that followed. At the end of that time, Eleanor Morgan, the mother of an hour, died. Three months later, Paul Morgan was killed in a railroad collision. After the funeral, Cyrus Morgan brought home to his wife their son's little daughter, Jocelyn Morgan. Her aunt, Anise Ashton, had wanted the baby. Cyrus Morgan had been almost rude in his refusal. His son's daughter should never be brought up by an actress. It was bad enough that her mother had been one, and doubtless transmitted the taint to her child. But in Spring Valley, if anywhere, it might be eradicated. At first, neither Cyrus nor Deborah cared much for Jocelyn. They resented her parentage, her strange, unmorgan-like name, and the pronounced resemblance she bore to the dark-haired, dark-eyed mother they had never seen. All the Morgans had been fair. If Jocelyn had had Paul's blue eyes and golden curls, her grandfather and grandmother would have loved her sooner. But the love came. It had to. No living mortal could have resisted Jocelyn. She was the most winsome and lovable little mite of babyhood that had ever toddled. Her big, dark eyes overflowed with laughter before she could speak. Her puckered red mouth broke constantly into dipples and cooing sounds. She had ways that no orthodox Spring Valley baby even thought of having. Every smile was a caress, every gurgle of attempted speech a song. Her grandparents came to worship her, and were stricter than ever with her by reason of their love. Because she was so dear to them, she must be saved from her mother's blood. Jocelyn shot up, through a roly-poly childhood, into slim, bewitching girlhood, in a chill, repressive atmosphere. Cyrus and Deborah were nothing if not thorough. The name of Jocelyn's mother was never mentioned to her. She was never called anything but Josie, which sounded more Christian-like than Jocelyn, and all the flowering out of her alien beauty was repressed as far as might be in the plainest and dullest of dresses, and the primmest arrangement possible to riotous ripe brown curls. The girl was never allowed to visit her Aunt Anise. Although frequently invited, Miss Ashton, however, wrote to her occasionally, and every Christmas sent a box of presents which even Cyrus and Deborah Morgan could not forbid her to accept. Although they looked with disapproving eyes and ominously set lips at the dainty, frivolous trifles the actress woman sent, they would have liked to cast those painted fans and lace frills and beflounced lingerie into the fire as if they had been infected rags from a pest house. The path thus set for Jocelyn's dancing feet to walk in was indeed sedate and narrow. She was seldom allowed to mingle with the young people of even quiet, harmless Spring Valley. She was never allowed to attend local concerts, much less take part in them. She was forbidden to read novels, and Cyrus Morgan burned an old copy of Shakespeare which Paul had given him years ago, and which he had himself read and treasured. 
lest its perusal would awaken unlawful instincts in Jocelyn's heart. The girl's passion for reading was so marked that her grandparents felt that it was their duty to repress it as far as lay in their power. But Jocelyn's vitality was such that all her bonds and bands served but little to check or retard the growth of her rich nature. Do what they might, they could not make a Morgan out of her. Her every step was a dance, her every word and gesture full of grace and virility that filled the old folks with uneasy wonder. She seemed to them charged with dangerous tendencies, all the more potent from repression. She was sweet-tempered and sunny, truthful and honest, but she was as little like the trim, simple Spring Valley girls as a crimson rose is like a field daisy, and her unlikeness bore heavily on her grandparents. Yet they loved her and were proud of her. Our girl Josie, as they called her, was more to them than they would have admitted even to themselves, and in the main they were satisfied with her, although the grandmother grumbled because Josie did not take kindly to patchwork or rug-making, and the grandfather would fain have toned down that exuberance of beauty and vivacity into the meeker pattern of maidenhood he had been accustomed to. When Jocelyn was seventeen, Deborah Morgan noticed a change in her. The girl became quieter and more brooding falling at times into strange idle reveries with her hands clasped over her knee and her big eyes fixed unseeingly on space or she would creep away for solitary rambles in the beechwood going away droopingly and returning with dusky glowing cheeks and a nameless radiance as of some newly discovered power shining through every muscle and motion mrs morgan thought the child needed a tonic and gave her sulphur and molasses one day the revelation came. Cyrus and Deborah had driven across the valley to visit their married daughter. Not finding her at home, they returned. Miss Morgan went into the house while her husband went to the stable. Jocelyn was not in the kitchen, but the grandmother heard the sound of voices and laughter in the sitting-room across the hall. "'What company has Josie got?' she wondered. As she opened the hall door and paused for a moment on the threshold to listen, as she listened, her old face grew gray and pinched. She turned noiselessly and left the house, and flew to her husband as one distracted. "'Cyrus! Josie is play-acting in the room, laughing and reciting and going on. I heard her. Oh, I've always feared it would break out on her, and it has. Come, you, and listen to her.' The old couple crept through the kitchen and across the hall to the open parlor door, as if they were stalking a thief. Jocelyn's laugh rang out as they did so, a mocking, triumphant peal. Cyrus and Deborah shivered as if they had heard sacrilege. Jocelyn had put on a trailing, clinging black skirt, which her aunt had sent her a year ago, and which she had never been permitted to wear. It transformed her into a woman. She had cast aside her waist of dark plum-colored homespun, and wrapped a silken shawl about herself, until only her beautiful arms and shoulders were bare. Her hair glossy and brown, with burnished red lights where the rays of the dull autumn sun struck on it through the window, was heaped high on her head, and held in place by a fillet of pearl beads. Her cheeks were crimson, her whole body from head to foot, instinct and alive with a beauty that to Cyrus and Deborah, as they stood mute with horror in the open doorway, seemed akin to some devilish enchantment. Jocelyn, wrapped away from her surroundings, did not perceive her grandparents. Her face was turned from them, and she was addressing an unseen auditor in passionate denunciation. She spoke, moved, posed, gesticulated, with an inborn genius shining through every motion and tone like an illuminating lamp. "'Josie, what are you doing?' It was Cyrus who spoke, advancing into the room like a stern, hard impersonation of judgment. Jocelyn's outstretched arm fell to her side, and she turned sharply around. Fear came into her face, and the light went out of it. A moment before she had been a woman, splendid, unafraid. Now she was again the schoolgirl, too confused and ashamed to speak. "'What are you doing, Josie, dressed up in that indecent manner, and talking and twisting yourself?' Jocelyn's face, that had grown pale, flamed scarlet again. She lifted her head proudly. "'I was trying Antonisa's part in her new play,' she answered. "'I have not been doing anything wrong, Grandfather.' "'Wrong? 
It's your mother's blood coming out in you, girl, in spite of all our care. Where did you get that play? Antony sent it to me, answered Jocelyn, casting a quick glance at the book on the table. Then, when her grandfather picked it up gingerly as if he feared contamination, she added quickly, Oh, give it to me, please, grandfather. Don't take it away. I'm going to burn it, said Cyrus Morgan sternly. Oh, don't, grandfather, cried Josie, with a sob in her voice. Don't burn it, please. I, I won't practice out of it any more. I'm sorry I've displeased you. Please give me my book. No, was the stern reply. Go to your room, girl, and take off that rig. There is to be no more play-acting in my house. Remember that. He flung the book into the fire that was burning in the grate. For the first time in her life, Jocelyn flamed out into passionate defiance. "'You are cruel and unjust, Grandfather. I have done no wrong. It is not doing wrong to develop the one gift I have. It's the only thing I can do, and I am going to do it. My mother was an actress and a good woman. So was Aunt Anise, so I mean to be.' "'Oh, Josie, Josie!' said her grandmother in a scared voice. Her grandfather only repeated sternly, "'Go take off that rig, girl, and let us hear no more of this.' Jocelyn went, but she left consternation behind her. Cyrus and Deborah could not have been more shocked if they had discovered the girl robbing her grandfather's desk. They talked the matter over bitterly at the kitchen hearth that night. "'We haven't been strict enough with the girl, mother,' said Cyrus angrily. We'll have to be stricter if we don't want to have her disgracing us. Did you hear how she defied me? So I mean to be, she says. Mother will have trouble with that girl yet. Don't be too harsh with her, Pa. It'll maybe only drive her to worse, sobbed Deborah. I ain't going to be harsh. What I do is for her own good. You know that, Mother. Josie is as dear to me as she is to you, but we've got to be stricter with her. They were. From that day Josie was watched and distrusted. She was never permitted to be alone. There were no more solitary walks. She felt herself under the surveillance of cold, unsympathetic eyes every moment, and her very soul writhed. Jocelyn Morgan, the high-spirited daughter of high-spirited parents, could not submit to such treatment. It might have passed with a child. To a woman, thrilling with life and conscious power to her very fingertips, it was galling beyond measure. Jocelyn rebelled, but she did nothing secretly. That was not her nature. She wrote to her aunt and niece, and when she received her reply she went straight and fearlessly to her grandparents with it. Grandfather, this letter is from my aunt. She wishes me to go and live with her and prepare for the stage. I told her I wished to do so. I am going. Cyrus and Deborah looked at her in mute dismay. I know you despise the profession of an actress, the girl went on with heightened color. I'm sorry you think so about it, because it is the only one open to me. I must go. I must. Yes, you must, said Cyrus cruelly. It's in your blood. Your bad blood, girl. My blood isn't bad, cried Jocelyn proudly. My mother was a sweet, true, good woman. You are unjust, grandfather. But I don't want you to be angry with me. I love you both, and I am very grateful indeed for all your kindness to me. I wish that you could understand what— We understand enough, interrupted Cyrus harshly. This is all I have to say. Go to your play-acting aunt if you want to. Your grandmother and me won't hinder you. But you'll come back here no more. We'll have nothing further to do with you. You can choose your own way and walk in it. With this dictum, Jocelyn went from Spring Valley. She clung to Deborah and wept at parting, but Cyrus did not even say good-bye to her. On the morning of her departure he went away on business and did not return until evening. Jocelyn went on the stage. Her aunt's influence and her mother's fame helped her much. She missed the hard experiences that come to the unassisted beginner. But her own genius must have won in any case. She had all her mother's gifts, deepened by her inheritance of Morgan intensity and sincerity, much, too, of the Morgan firmness of will. When Jocelyn Morgan was twenty-two, she was famous over two continents. When Cyrus Morgan returned home on the evening after his granddaughter's departure, he told his wife that she was never to mention the girl's name in his hearing again. Deborah obeyed. She thought her husband was right. 
albeit she might in her own heart deplore the necessity of such a decree, Jocelyn had disgraced them. Could that be forgiven? Nevertheless, both the old people missed her terribly. The house seemed to have lost its soul with that vivid, ripely tinted young life. They got their married daughter's oldest girl, Pauline, to come and stay with them. Pauline was a quiet, docile maiden, industrious and commonplace just such a girl as they had vainly striven to make of Jocelyn, to whom Pauline had always been held up as a model. Neither Cyrus nor Deborah took to her, and they let her go unregretfully when they found she wished to return home. "'She hasn't any of Josie's gimp,' was Cyrus's unspoken fault. Deborah spoke, but all she said was, "'Polly's a good girl, father, only she hasn't any snap.' Jocelyn wrote to Deborah occasionally, telling her freely of her plans and doings. If it hurt the girl that no notice was ever taken of her letters, she still wrote them. Deborah read the letters grimly and left them in Cyrus's way. Cyrus would not read them at first. Later on he read them stealthily when Deborah was out of the house. When Jocelyn began to succeed, she sent the old farmhouse papers and magazines containing her photographs and criticisms on her plays and acting. Deborah cut them out and kept them in her upper bureau drawer with Jocelyn's letters. Once she overlooked one, and Cyrus found it when he was kindling the fire. He got the scissors and cut it out carefully. A month later Deborah discovered it between the leaves of the family Bible. But Jocelyn's name was never mentioned between them, and when other people asked them concerning her their replies were cold and ungracious. In a way they had relented towards her, but their shame of her remained. They could never forget that she was an actress. Once, six years after Jocelyn had left Spring Valley, Cyrus, who was reading a paper by the table, got up with an angry exclamation and stuffed it into the stove, thumping the lid on over it with grim malignity. "'That fool don't know what he's talking about,' was all he would say. Deborah had her share of curiosity. The paper was the National Gazette, and she knew that their next-door neighbor, James Pennon, took it. She went over that evening and borrowed it, saying that their own had been burned before she had had time to read the serial in it. With one exception, she read all its columns carefully, without finding anything to explain her husband's anger. Then she doubtfully plunged into the exception, a column of stage notes. Halfway down she came upon the adverse criticism of Jocelyn Morgan and her new play. It was malicious and vituperative. Deborah Morgan's old eyes sparked dangerously as she read it. I guess somebody is pretty jealous of Josie, she muttered. I don't wonder Pa was riled up, but I guess she can hold her own. She's a Morgan. No long time after this, Cyrus took a notion he'd like a trip to the city. He'd like to see the horse fair and look up Cousin Hiram Morgan's folks. Hiram and me used to be great chums, mother. And we're getting kind of mossy, I guess, never stirring out of Spring Valley. Let's go and dissipate for a week. What say? Deborah agreed readily, albeit of late years she had been much adverse to going far from home, and had never at any time been very fond of Cousin Hiram's wife. Cyrus was as pleased as a child over their trip. On the second day of their sojourn in the city he slipped away when Deborah had gone shopping with Mrs. Hiram, and hurried through the streets to the Green Square Theatre with a hang-dog look. He bought a ticket apologetically, and sneaked into his seat. It was a matinee performance, and Jocelyn Morgan was starring in her famous new play. Cyrus waited for the curtain to rise, feeling as if every one of his Spring Valley neighbors must know where he was and revile him for it, if Deborah were to ever find out. But Deborah must never find out. For the first time in their married life the old man deliberately plotted to deceive his old wife. He must see his girl Josie just once. It was a terrible thing that she was an actress, but she was a successful one, nobody could deny that except fools who yapped in the National Gazette. The curtain went up, and Cyrus rubbed his eyes. He had certainly braced his nerves to behold some mystery of iniquity. Instead, he saw an old kitchen, so like his own at home that it bewildered him. And there, sitting by the cheery wood stove, in homespun gown, with primly braided hair, was Jocelyn, his girl Josie, as he had seen her a thousand times by his own ingle side. The building rang with applause. 
One old man pulled out a red bandana and wiped tears of joy and pride from his eyes. She hadn't changed. Josie hadn't changed. Play-acting hadn't spoiled her. Couldn't spoil her. Wasn't she Paul's daughter? And all this applause was for her, for Josie. Jocelyn's new play was a homely, pleasant production with rollicking comedy and heart-moving pathos skillfully commingled. Jocelyn pervaded it all with a convincing simplicity that was really a triumph of art. Cyrus Morgan listened and exulted in her. At every burst of applause his eyes gleamed with pride. He wanted to go on the stage and box the ears of the villain who plotted against her. He wanted to shake hands with the good woman who stood by her. He wanted to pay off the mortgage and make Josie happy. He wiped tears from his eyes in the third act when Josie was turned out of doors, and when the fourth left her a happy, blushing bride, hand in hand with her farmer lover, he could have wept again for joy. Cyrus Morgan went out into the daylight feeling as if he had awakened from a dream. At the outer door he came upon Mrs. Hiram and Deborah. Deborah's face was stained with tears, and she caught his hand. "'Oh, Pa, wasn't it splendid? Wasn't our girl Josie splendid? I'm so proud of her. Oh, I was bound to hear her. I was afraid you'd be mad, so I didn't let on. And when I saw you in the seat down there, I couldn't believe my eyes. Oh, I've just been crying the whole time. Wasn't it splendid? Wasn't our girl Josie splendid?' The crowd around looked at the old pair with amused, indulgent curiosity, but they were quite oblivious to their surroundings, even to Mrs. Hiram's anxiety to decoy them away. Cyrus Morgan cleared his throat and said, "'It was great, mother, great. She took the shine off the other play-actors all right. I knew that National Gazette man didn't know what he was talking about.' Mother, let's go and see Josie right off. She's stopping with her aunt at the Maybury Hotel. I saw it in the paper this morning. I'm going to tell her she was right and we were wrong. Josie beat them all, and I'm going to tell her so. End of Our Girl Josie Recording by Michelle Remington